Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Mary Ellen Iskandarian, President and CEO of Women's World Banking. Women's World Banking is devoted to giving more low-income women around the world access to the financial tools and resources they require to achieve security and prosperity. Mary Ellen has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us, so I'd like to thank you, Mary Ellen, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Why do women require an organization like Women's World Banking? Well, because women need financial resources, and unfortunately, in every country, in every, across every income uh, stratum, we see a very, very pronounced gender gap. So let me say a word about how Women's World Banking is organized. We always work through local financial institutions. The majority of those are members, formal members that meet a very strict set of membership criteria. Um, there are 38 financial institutions in 28 developing countries that we do a whole ar array of product development and, and leadership development training, um, peer learning. But we are also working increasingly with mainstream financial institutions that are recognizing the, the huge market opportunity at the base of the pyramid. So you act as a type of a consultant for these organizations, trying to help them mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. think through what it is like to provide products and services that are specifically geared to the needs of women. Precisely. You, you, you put that perfectly. Have you seen evidence of increased economic activity, increased prosperity among women who have been able to access the financial systems? Oh, a absolutely. And, and it's actually tremendously rewarding when, again, we, we stop thinking that all these people need is a loan, but that they need access to a whole array of products. So, for instance, in the financial institutions that we work with, with the, uh, around the world, the member institutions of Women's World Banking, um, we were learning that women were, spent, were saving 10 to 15 percent of monthly income in the, in the event of health emergencies. So we knew that there was this very considerable sum of money that was being saved, but maybe a savings account wasn't the best product. Maybe a health insurance product would be a better way for them to prepare for that, that emergency. We also know that women rank uh, health as the number one cost and concern that they take on in, in the household. So we've developed a, a uh, health insurance product that quite frankly we never imagined would be as successful as A health as insurance it's product, out. that's interesting. So are you an insurer or are you a, uh, an organization that, that acts as an interlocutor between the insurance companies and women? Most of our, our uh, local partners that we're working with, and we're, we've rolled this product out in six countries, very, very different countries too, with very different sets of uh, financial systems and, and health issues. For example? So we piloted in Jordan, for example. Mm -hmm. One of the really exciting things we saw with this product is, first of all, we insisted that maternal health be covered. And so we have seen, anecdotally, I'm very, I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to, um, to put more rigorous research behind this in the next year, um, but we've seen an anecdotal um, increase in attended births. So women knowing that they'll have a hospital stay for giving birth covered will opt to go to the hospital. We also see women themselves seeking care at an earlier stage in an illness, knowing that that uh, absence from the business will be will be covered if they seek care. With amelioration to the risk to the child, better health outcomes for women, happier families, lower cost, a, um, a environment where there is less disruption to, um, to the economic life of a family, uh, while the birth of a child is a joyous occasion, um, the surprise that can, a, can attend a complication um, is, can, can have a real impact, particularly people who are living on the edge of, uh, of, exactly. uh, of uh, on the financial edge. Exactly. There's also been a tremendous impact on the financial institution. So our partner was primarily a distribution channel mm -hmm. for a local insurer. 
And uh, so they have not only been able to diversify their source of revenue, so they weren't just making loans to this Both the local insurer and the local bank. And the local bank, exactly. But they were also able to dramatically increase, from an already pretty high level, client retention. The clients that have not only the loan but also the health insurance have a retention rate in the high 80s, which is which is phenomenal for a financial institution. And we know it's it's less expensive, it's easier to go after an existing client right. with a second product than it is to go out and find that new client. So talk about how the organization uh, functions and the kind of competencies that you have as, as part of, of, of your nonprofit uh, family. Uh, we work on a three-year strategic planning basis. And in 2011, the strategic plan that we designed for 2011 to 2013 was very much focused on this product development strategy. Mm -hmm. So we brought in folks with, um, with very good you know, product development backgrounds and savings and in credit, both for enterprises and for farmers. So we do quite a bit of work in providing rural women with access to finance. We provide uh, both girls and women's and uh, adult savings accounts, and they're, they are very different types of products, and then this insurance product. So, so people with very mainstream financial product development um, background. As 2011 to 2013 you know, sort of rolled out, we had a number of very successful pilots of these, uh, this group of products that I just described, but we were seeing repeatedly that the difference between a successful rollout and one that, that lagged a bit was whether leadership could have vision, could, could see their way to innovate. So after the great success with the Women's Leadership Program, we brought in, we introduced a program for, for CEOs and their direct reports that's very focused on innovation and what leadership in a fast-changing, innovating organization looks like. And these CEOs are thinking about how do we expand our business? How do we, ex how do we gain more clients? And so they're coming in to benefit from your consulting, from, from the advice that you can provide on helping them expand their markets. Right. And you know, I would be uh, less, than, less than honest if I didn't say, while we have them in the classroom, we are you know, sending very, very uh, targeted messages about women as clients, about wh how to uh, how to market to women, how to sell to women, and they <laughs> and they all know, yeah. right? They all know. I mean, they know that th that they're being um, uh, they're talking with evangelists um, <laughs> yes. for for this business. So, in terms of your staff, uh, talk about talk about how many people work for um, Women's World Banking and where they're located and how you hire them. So we are thrilled. We have just hired our 50th uh, staff member. Um, right now, we are structured with roughly sort of 44 of us here in New York. Um, in fact, we just moved to to really beautiful new office space in the Channon Building just across mm -hmm. from Grand Central. And then we have six staff that are, you know, interestingly, some of them are based in the field. We have a, one of our, our leading credit um, folks is based in, in Malawi. She's resident within a bank that we're doing a great deal of work with. But then I, I have to say it's been it's been increasingly difficult for us to recruit at you know a relatively senior level because right. we're we're talking about staff that can work at a, a fairly senior level within a large financial institution, a commercial financial institution, um, and getting them to relocate to New York. That's that's turned out to be a bit of an issue. So we've had to get quite uh, quite creative and so we've got staff in Rio and Montreal and Zurich who uh, who are all working right alongside but uh, and technology has helped us enormously. Is it necessary anymore with uh, with Skype and desktop sharing and and uh, the ability to connect in such a convenient way instant messaging and so on is it necessary anymore that everybody be co-located? I, I don't think it's necessary but I do think culture is hugely important and that is harder to do via instant messaging and so we do we do bring people together um, quite frequently, we make sure everyone, particularly during the early stages of their time with us, um, they're spending time um, in New York. 
when I am, um, I do every six months, I do um, a fairly thorough interview with the CEOs of institutions where I have a team on the ground mm -hmm. and actually doing consulting work. And cons very consistently, we get, you know, very, very, I mean, almost verbatim, the same words are used that these banks see Women's World Banking as distinct from their typical consultants. Right. That consultants will come in, they will do a report, they will leave that report on the shelf. With us, they recognize your word evangelical is perfect because they recognize we have a real stake in the outcome of that assignment. And so it really tempers the way we work with that client. And so bringing somebody in and if all they were seeing was, you know, how we work on Skype, I think some of that that evangelical passion about why we do what we do might not get communicated quite as clearly. What is the makeup of your of your staff? Are many uh, women? Um, are many from the countries um, that you serve? Right now, we are two thirds uh, women and one third incredibly highly evolved men. Um, <laughs> the, the men at Women's World Banking are really quite quite remarkable, um, and believe every bit as wholeheartedly in in the mission that we're after. And yes, we we make a very um, concerted effort to recruit from the uh, the countries that we're working in and, and feel that, that that tie back to the local market, the local understanding, the cultural um, dynamics. Do you ever encounter situations in which you're accused of, of flying in the face of cultural traditions or, or uh, societal norm, norms, uh, being the, the New York-based nonprofit uh, interfering in a particular uh, country's uh, uh, practices? I wouldn't say, I, I think for a, a number of reasons, we actually are a, a registered Dutch charity. Mm -hmm. And so I think for a variety of reasons, even though our, we're headquartered here, we've got the, the Dutch, we have managed to maintain a fairly international character. So I don't get the, you know, who are you to fly in and tell me what to do. Right. But some of what we are proposing, and, and when you start to get to, to, you know, the biggest barrier to access to finance for women of, with businesses of any size. So when you start to talk about small and medium-sized enterprises, mm -hmm. which are the largest job creators in just about every economy in the world, their biggest barrier for women is collateral. And that gets into issues of property rights, that gets into in issues into title and ownership, which in some countries are the trickiest, stickiest cultural issues. So I'd say you know where the where 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 power and money start to uh, and and possession start to uh, to rub up against each other. Yes, we we do encounter um, some interesting conversations. Um, what seems to trump most of them, though, is when when everyone can recognize the economic growth either in the household itself that everybody's you know eating three meals a day and there's a little bit more protein on the table than there than there was previously or at the at the macro level you know we've still you know Goldman Sachs did a paper last International Women's Day that looked at how much what the credit gap was for small and medium-sized enterprises in the BRIC countries and the next 11 um, developing economies and the number was something like $320 billion of credit that could be used by viable companies in these countries. And if they were able to close that gap, the GDP growth in those 17 countries would be another 12%. I mean, that's a huge amount of money that's literally just being left on the table. So, I mean, I'm very excited that we not only can make this household argument now to you know, to individual men and women, but we are able increasingly to make a very profound macro argument to policymakers, regulators, and that slowly starts to 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 um, erode away some of those cultural issues. And what does your revenue stream look like? Do you have earned income elements and contributed income elements? How does that how does that manifest? Right, right. we do. Um, we are still primarily donor funded. Mm -hmm. um, I think our, our donor mix is an interesting one. Fully 50% of our funding comes from a wonderful, wonderful group of very committed, primarily European uh, governments who really recognize the importance of gender equality, but also 
economic opportunity, and so that we're kind of sitting in that nice sweet spot. The remaining um, roughly 50% of our funding comes from, we have a very strong corporate um, funding base and, uh, and some foundation funding. Not that much uh, individual funding, but mm -hmm. there, there are some individual donors who very much understand our, our mission and are, are keen um, to, uh, to back us. But we're also very excited about the increasing fee-for-service um, business that we're doing, as you were saying earlier, sort of that consulting work. The other piece that I'm extremely excited about is we were seeing we were we were seeing many of these financial institutions um, who were perhaps registered as NGOs initially if they were originally microfinance institutions mm -hmm. or perhaps they weren't full service financial institutions deciding to become banks needing to raise a lot more capital and actually coming to us and saying we'd love you to be a shareholder you've you've brought real value to right. our our balance sheet and I didn't have that kind of uh, that kind of capital to uh, to take those equity stakes. So I was thrilled that in June of 2014 we closed on a 50 million private 50 million dollar private equity fund that is allowing us to do just that. Take small stakes, and they are mostly right. they are certainly all minority stakes, but they are relatively small, um, but large enough to get us a board seat because we feel strongly about about sitting on the boards. And right now, the, the NGO, the Women's World Banking NGO, is the general partner. So if we've done a good job, um, as we start to divest, the majority of that, that carried interest of those profits from those investments will come back to the NGO as, uh, as earned revenue. Well, just taking the step in which you are eliciting the concession that your work and the prospect of increasing business with women is in the economic and financial interests of these organizations is a huge step. I mean, it basically is a bet on the future yeah. and a desire to ensure that that, in, in, in that future is advanced by having access to your expertise. That's, that's a huge step. Yeah. That's a huge step, particularly when one considers that many of these banks are dominated by men who grew up in a uh, in a system that um, intentionally or unintentionally excluded women. So you have men who are basically looking at, at their business interests and they're saying, we really need the expertise of an organization like yours, and uh, what might come next? Well, I think, you know, men are very rational actors. When I can show them... <laughs> Thank you. On, on behalf of my gender. <laughs> you're you're I, more than welcome. I'm very appreciative of that. <laughs> I mean, when you can show them, really, a, and across the board, women are better loan repayers. They tend to, they tend to, to save at, a, at, a, at an instant smaller amounts, but they leave that money in the bank. They're very what banks call sticky deposits. Right. So the balances accrue much, much larger. Women in all countries, developed, developing, are twice as likely as men to buy multiple products from a financial institution mm -hmm. that they trust. Right. They are also very loyal, as and, and yet we know the opposite, that they will tell everybody that they could possibly can if they've not been treated well, <laughs> but they will also, you know, tell the, tell the good story and they will stick with, with the institution. We, um, we recently just did some fascinating research in the Dominican Republic where we had developed a girls' savings account for girls as young as seven um, five years ago. And we'd been tracking the girls. We had really great impact data to see what had happened from these girls who'd been saving over the period of time. But we went back and looked at what the bank had done and how it had actually affected the bank. And we were thrilled that the product had broken even in three years. So while these were very, very small accounts, I mean, you, oh, can, you course, can imagine, yeah. um, the reason they had broken even is that the, the name of the account is Mia, so mine. So of the Mia families, you had the girl, but you had the mother, the father, and in almost all cases, you had the grandmother as well, who were now banking. They had better loan repayment rates, the MIA families. They had higher savings balances, and they were putting larger remittance payments through the bank. So the mm. bank was actually making more money off of those payments. And a bank that already had a client retention rate of, you know, in the high 60s, for the MIA families, again, was, is, was 82%. 
So there was a really strong business case, and we just love the idea of these little girls and you know these little pink passbooks um, being the lead generator for all of this other business that that came along. And so it was fan fairly fantastic to be able to tell that story. Well, Mary Ellen Eskandarian, <laughs> this is a fascinating example of how a business-oriented yet social good way of thinking can have a dramatic impact on our world. Thank you so much for sharing well, your story you with us. Thank you for this opportunity. Us. Thank you for telling us about Women's World Banking, and thank you for your insights. Great. Thank you.